When did you last break the rules? Just stop for a moment and have a think. When was the last time you behaved in a way that was completely different from how you would normally conduct yourself? Let loose, through caution to the wind, did and said things that you wouldn't normally dare. How many of you struggle to think of an answer? You see, according to historian Johann Norberg, for us living in the West, the golden age is now. That for us, we have access to more freedoms than at any other point in human history. But how free do we actually feel? How many of us can say, hand on heart, that we regularly, if ever, have experienced pure, unabashed freedom? Because I think it is a fundamental human need to break from the norm. And don't just take my word for it. People have been doing it for millennia. They call it carnival. So what do we mean when we say carnival? What springs to mind? Uh, maybe we're thinking Notting Hill, Rio de Janeiro, uh, masks, clowns, floats, that sort of thing. But if we're going to be technical, that's what we mean when we think about carnival. This is a painting by Peter Bruegel the Elder, painted in 1559. It's called Carnival versus Lent. You see, carnival comes from the 16th century Italian word carne vale, literally the absence of flesh. And it was traditionally a last hurrah following the excesses of Christmas before the more somber times of Ash Wednesday and Lent. Let's look at the picture in a little bit more detail. At the bottom, in the centre, slightly to the right, you will see a big, round, jolly fat man sat on a beer barrel with a pork pie on his head. <laughs> he's carnival. Now, he's surrounded by lots of people in fancy dress, masks with food. There's people dancing and drinking, hanging out of pub windows. On the other side, he's jousting with a thin, somber, tall lady. She's Lent. On her side of the painting, there's a monk and a nun. People give to charity and go to church. Which side of the painting would you rather be on? I know for me, I would like to be with the jolly fat man on the beer barrel any day of the week. So we can deduce from this that carnival is traditionally a, a period of excess, of drinking, of dressing up, which is in direct contrast to the more somber times of the rest of the year. But if that's all we think of as carnival, then we're actually doing it a disservice. Because carnival, true carnival, has been around for millennia. If you go back to the Roman Saturnalia or, or the Babylonian Sakaia festivals, things really got crazy. For a period of time, slaves would swap places with their masters. They would sit at their table, drink their wine, eat their food, sleep in their bed, frolic with their concubines. Of course, at the end of the festival, in order to restore order, the slave was then put to death. So, you know, swings and roundabouts. But for that period of time, all bets were off and anything went. You see, the authorities believed that in order to drive out the creeping darkness of winter and to make way for the hope and light of spring, they needed this period of misrule. And they also realized that if they did this in an organized way, the people would be able to express these freedoms in a safe, controlled manner. I mean, think of it like a pressure valve. You use that carnival valve, it releases that tension, and then, in a fairly controlled way, and then things go back to normal. But actually, if we unpick it, carnival is more than just an excuse to get drunk. It, it's a festival for people, normal, everyday people like you and me to occasionally break away from those author authoritarian diktats and shackles that r run their lives. Let me talk to you about Antonin Arto, a writer, director, actor. And my two favorite facts about Arto were, one, he was once thrown out of the surrealist movement for being too strange. <laughs> And two, that when he died, he was found, sat on the floor at the foot of his bed, holding a shoe in his left hand and surrounded by rats. 
Now, for Arto, he wrote a series of essays called The Theatre and Its Double, in which he tried to find ways to make theatre relevant again, following the frothy comedy that came out of the Théâtre de Paris. And his most famous theater, uh, theory was the theatre of cruelty. And in that, he explored lots of theatrical techniques, lights, sound, costume, performance skills, in order to try and create a theatre that bypassed your intellectual brain and punched you straight in the gut. Uh, for instance, he might play a sound like fingernails down a blackboard, or the sound of a knife scraping along a plate. And I imagine even just thinking about that sound, for some of you, makes you kind of shudder. But that's precisely it. It taps into something that stops us thinking intellectually and hits us straight here. But for Arto, horror and discomfort was not the only way to achieve this. He also believed you could bring about this instinctive guttural reaction through laughter. I mean, think about it. How many of us have been in that situation where we've laughed so hard we've cried? Or we've snorted? A little bit of snot comes out. Maybe we break wind a little. It happens. <laughs> we are really obsessed with how we look, how we carry ourselves, how we come across to other people. But if we're out in public, comedy club, for instance, and something really, really makes us laugh, we forget all of that as we lean on a complete stranger and cackle away. And so for Arto, theatre was in decline because on the one hand, it had lost any sense of seriousness. But on the other a sense of laughter. In a word, danger. Because no, make no mistake, true laughter is dangerous. It's chaotic. It's anarchic. It's freeing. And it's that connection between laughter and freedom that is so crucial to what I want to talk to you about today. Let me introduce you to another gentleman, Mikhail Bakhtin, a Russian philosopher, literary theorist, scholar. Now, we're interested in him because in 1965, he published a fascinating book called Rabelais and His World. And in it, he explores the writings of the French Renaissance writer, Francois Rabelais, a man infamous for being lewd, crude, and rude. And Bakhtin particularly focuses on one of his books about two giants called Gargantua and Pantagruel. And in it, he explores the connection between laughter and freedom and how it is all embodied within carnival. You see, for Bakhtin, carnival is not simply a time, a piece of calendar prescribed by church or state. It's a force that pre-exists priests and kings. I mean, just think about that for a moment. He is arguing that there is something, that this need for freedom to break from the norm is something that is so fundamental that are, to our humanity. It is a quintessential part of who we are. So let me come back to my original question. How free do we feel? Sure, we might go once a year to the Christmas party. We might drink too much, tell our boss exactly what we think of him, and bust some moves on the dance floor we probably never should. Maybe once a year we do go to the Notting Hill Carnival or celebrate the festival of Purim, which is the Jewish carnival, or make the most of our time before Lent. But how closely related that to that is carnival? That true feast of time, of becoming, of change and of renewal. A time when the lowest of the low were raised up high and given a voice. A time when those who were up high, priests, kings, popes, were brought down low. A time when the most sacrosanct liturgies that could not be touched on pain of death were allowed to be taken, deconstructed, ripped apart, and rewritten with the most obscene language and imagery imaginable. And not as a way to attack the gods, but as a way to praise the people. Because these things, toiletry habits, Sex, all of those things are fundamental to what it means to be a human being. They represent life. Now, I don't want you to take from this talk that I am suggesting everyone goes out, gets drunk, and tells people what you really think of them. But what I do 
want you to think about is what connection, if any, do our lives still have to this most fundamental way of expressing our freedoms? I mean, admittedly, here in the West, we are fortunate enough that we don't live under a dictatorship. And we don't live under a theocracy. So maybe the argument can be put forward that we don't need this pressure valve anymore. But if we go back and we make that connection between freedom and between laughter, a laughter and an abandon that maybe we haven't experienced since childhood, isn't it a little bit sad that we may not have anything so purifying as that in our lives? Think about all the pressures and demands on our time, on our energies, on our focus. Don't you think we should let into our lives a little bit of topsy-turvy, a little bit of chaos, a little bit of misrule, and the laughter that can come from freedom? Now, as is traditional with all periods of misrule, order must be restored, and so I must bring my speech to an end. <laughs> but I do want to leave you with one final thought. Victor Hugo once wrote, everything being a constant carnival, there is no carnival left. Don't you think we should do something about that? 